Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Holly Randall Unfiltered. Um, today, my guest has blown up since she got in the industry just three years ago. In 2023, she was nominated for seven AVN awards, including Female Performer of the Year. I had the honor of shooting her for a Twisties Treat of the Month. And in fact, I actually did the 10 Questions series interview with her, but um, we weren't entirely happy with the out of sync audio and video. So I was like, I need to bring her back in here. She's super interesting. We need to sit down for a long form interview. So here she is, everybody, the one and only Lily Bell. Hello. <laughs> How are you? I'm awesome. I love the outfit today. We were talking about this a little Thank bit before you. we started. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I, I did the fun vibes today. Yeah. yeah. The, what did you say, Powder Puff? Power Puff yeah, Girls. Powerpuff Girls, yeah. Which is something I've also never actually watched, but I don't know. You just had Very that, bubbles. Like, yes. Yeah, yeah. The yes. blonde one, yeah. That adorable like, vibe going <laughs> Thank on. Thank you. I love it. I appreciate it. So, Lily, um, you know, we usually start with one's origin story, and mm -hmm. I figure out that's that's where we'll start here. So right. tell us about how you got into this this lovely industry that we work in. It's super lovely, yes. Um, let's see. Uh, well, I started with sex work with camming. Mm -hmm. um, I was told by somebody in Portland, uh, I don't know if you know her, her name's Cameron Canella. She mm -hmm. was in for like a little bit. But mm -hmm. She was friends with like Janice Griffith and stuff mm -hmm. like that. But um, she told me if you've never done a lick of sex work, please, before you do porn, do something, do camming, do stripping, try something else. And I said, uh, okay. So I decided to. I I started camming um, and I actually started camming because I got in a couple car accidents and I needed to pay those off. And a couple of car accidents. Yeah, like I got in like four in a row. Four? Yeah, it was really unfortunate. Did you just have like bad luck or? Well, so it's like in Portland, there was a big influx of people moving, a lot of Californians moving to Portland. It's funny, my sister moved there recently. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And I used to be really sour about that. Like when I worked at this hostess restaurant, I'd always make a point to be like and did you move from California mm -hmm. I'm sure you know yeah. like I was always yeah. Um, yeah but anyway now here I am a transplant moving mm -hmm. to California so but uh I kept getting in car accidents because I was working an office job and I drive from Beaverton back uh from Portland back to Beaverton and I just was not being a defensive driver I was going and weaving and then I wasn't I wasn't paying attention and I rear-ended a few people and then I think it was literally just because I was frustrated. I wanted to get home. And then, uh, yeah, and then it just happened one after another. And it was just really bad luck. And then yeah. I remember on the fourth one, I was like, this is ridiculous. Like, I can't, I'm not making money really at an office. I need to start making extra money. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Wow. I know. Wow. It's embarrassing. I actually don't really like talking about it because it's like, it's just like, and they're all your fault. I'm like, yeah, but I swear I've really become a defensive driver when I moved here to LA. Um, I've only gotten in two accidents and both of them were not my fault. Other mm -hmm. people rear-ended me. Okay. And I got rear-ended at talent testing and there was this young boy, I think he was like 19. He hopped out of the car and he went, oops, my B, you know? And I was like, <laughs> you know what? Don't worry about it. I, I didn't even get his information. Oh, I didn't wow. do anything. I said, I just, because the thing is like, I wish someone would have done that for me. Yeah. You know? So I thought it was good karma and he barely even touched it. So yeah. Yeah. Anyway. Well, I mean, if it makes you feel any better, I caused a five car pileup on the freeway with my van on my way to set. Okay. Um, and I rear-ended. Uh, no, this yeah. was, this was like five, six years ago. Okay. And I rear-ended. Yeah. And I caused a five car pileup and one of the women was pregnant. Which wow. didn't feel so good. Everybody was fine. Everybody was okay. Yeah. But um, yeah, that that was not a nice feeling. So no. you know, I'm not a I don't have a perfect driving record. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, I can relate. Yeah, lessons learned for sure. So you started off with camming. Mm -hmm. How was that for you? It was great. You know, I had a lot of fire in me. Like I remember just like I used to fuck myself on that website for little to no money. Like I remember just like not knowing what I was doing. I, I was watching different girls and then I had, you know, a moderator come on and say, you need to up your prices. Like, mm -hmm. I don't know what you're doing, but like this is not it. And so I had this guy named Johnny like help me a lot in the beginning. And then that's how I discovered Lainey Gray because mm -hmm. she was on the same side as me, Cam Soda. And so mm -hmm. I watched her and I remember she's talked about this in an interview. I don't remember this, but when I watched an interview of her, she said that I went into her room and I tipped her and then I started talking to her that way because that's how you have to do it with girls. You can't just like be in their room because they yeah. see that you're there. They'll block you and they'll get pissed. Mm -hmm. And so like- Because they, do they think you're they're tr you're trying to poach fans? Yeah, or yeah. copy or, or anything like yeah. that. And I realized that that was an etiquette quickly because I got yeah. blocked from a couple girls' rooms and I was like, oh, I'm just, I'm just watching. Like I'm yeah. not, I really wasn't, because in my head too, I'm like, 
what new thing are you going to think of that everyone else hasn't already kind of thought of? Yeah. Like, and I, I'm, and I wasn't even thinking about poaching fans. So, mm-hmm. yeah. And Camp Soda's small. So it's kind of like they're going to go wherever they're going to go. Right. Yeah. Right. Okay. And so you watched Lainey and mm-hmm. you got some ideas on like your pricing mm-hmm. and stuff like that. Yeah. So I did, I did that. And then I was in a relationship at the time and he, you know, he was okay with it, but he was okay with it to a point where he, I where I wasn't pushing him. Like eventually, you know, he said, "You keep pushing me," because I said, "You know, I want to do content with girls, and I want to." He's like, "This thing keeps growing. Like mm-hmm. you were just camming in your bedroom, and all of a sudden you want to go to Vegas and shoot with girls. Like mm-hmm. that's not happening." But I did it anyway Mm -hmm. because I didn't want to be in a relationship where I couldn't do things but at the same time I was in one of those relationships Mm -hmm. and I just you know and I was pushing him I mean he met me as I was an administrative assistant for an office he Mm -hmm. was a finance guy we were both like in a corporate world then I started doing this like double life like a dirty Hannah Montana I felt like yeah secret and I didn't know and no one knew about it you know and then my parents kept saying they said Lily this isn't gonna work you know eventually you're gonna have to choose Mm -hmm. it's not gonna work and it, it got to the point where, like, because he went to Indiana University, and I I blocked Oregon and California, but I didn't think to block other states. So, like, all of his fraternity brothers that went to, like, New Jersey, New York, Chicago, Florida, like, all the all over, they were watching me, mm-hmm. and all of them were talking about it for, like, months, and they like video recorded me and then sent it in this like group me message like all of his fraternity bros and it kind of like flipped his world upside down because it was like like I did this private once with this guy and he said oh me and and he said my uh, ex's name said me and your ex you know or but it was my current boyfriend he said we should tag team you and I was like how the hell do you know my boyfriend's name yeah he said oh I went to school with them that's creepy it was and that was one of my regulars that I had for a bit Oh. And so I'm sitting there staring at a screen and it's black. I don't see him. And yeah. then I'm just sitting there like, what? You know, yeah, yeah it was it was shocking. And um, I just I felt bad for him. Um, but it, I mean, he ended up cheating on me. So I don't really feel that bad. But at the time, <laughs> I did feel bad. But it, I think there's a reason why he did cheat on me. I think he just couldn't handle the fact that I was doing something like this. Mm-hmm. Like he acted like it was OK, but it wasn't. I mean, it's hard. You know, I think yeah. it's hard for a lot of guys. And it's understandable that it's hard. Like mm-hmm. it doesn't you know, it doesn't work for some people. Some people are okay with it. Um, I think it takes actually a really strong man to support um, their girl doing sex work. Yeah. Because a lot of guys are not okay with that. No. No. So. And, um, you know, like he, yeah, he had just some really gross, gross dude friends that were fraternity, frat bro, you know, that yeah. style of guy. And yeah. that's just what that was. Yeah. yeah. And he he was that too. So. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So you mentioned that your parents um, said to you that you had to choose. Mm-hmm. So your parents knew that you were doing this from the start. From the jump. Yeah. I actually, um, Spiegler was the first person I ever talked to in porn. So mm-hmm. before I, I'm actually trying to remember this timeline. Because like while I was dating my ex, I did want to do porn, but I I didn't because I talked to Spiegler and I remember he was like, Gina Valentina's living in my house right now. Um, If you want to sign with me, you know, you got to do it all. You have to do that. And I just remember being like, click. Like, I I was like, that's not my MO. Like, I can't. I can't. And I also was in the relationship. And, you know, I remember one night, you know, he said, if you want to do porn, like, then don't be with me. And I said, I see a future with you. I see, you know, having your children. I see marrying you. So I will cut this out of my life. So I really, like, I remember I unfollowed all these porn accounts. Like, everything. Like, I was like, okay, you know what? That's not going to be my life anymore. But then I got into and I wasn't even doing porn. It was just like, I was a porn fanatic. Like I liked the lifestyle and mm-hmm. I always just wanted to be part of this, but mm-hmm. I just was too scared. And mm-hmm. I just was like, you know, so I worked at an office cause that's what so my parents would want. And mm-hmm. yeah, yeah, I don't know. So yeah. That's crazy. So, so, okay. So obviously you broke up with him. Mm-hmm. Um, how did you tell your parents that you were doing this? Okay, I'm like kind of ADDing out. So I'm like, there's a lot of this with this timeline. So I'm like trying to, yeah. Um, So the the way that I told my parents uh, is I sat down with my stepdad. And I remember I told him that I called Spiegler. And he knew about Spiegler, obviously, because he knows of Sasha Gray and like people Mm -hmm. like that. So, And then also just for my audience, because some people don't know, uh, Spiegler is, she's referring to Mark Spiegler, who is a talent agent in the adult industry. He's actually kind of one of the more respected and... um, 
I don't know, more prestigious yeah. talent Asians. I think like mm-hmm. a lot of girls, there's like notoriety in being a Spiegler girl, but he's yeah. also like a real no nonsense, no bullshit guy, which is kind of what like people love about him. Mm-hmm. And his whole thing is if you join his agency, you have to be down to do it all, you know, boy, girl, anal, everything. Um, but he's upfront about it, which is nice. Yeah. So and just also for context. time has changed. Like he's not like that as much anymore. Back then it, it was more intense like that. Mm-hmm. I guess now things have kind of gotten less. Yeah. Well, he's a yet. little, he's not as involved in his agency yeah. as he was yeah. since he got sick and everything. So hundred yeah. percent. Um, so, you know, I, I sat my stepdad down. I remember we were at some brewery and I, just said, this is something I want to do. And he was actually really supportive of me Mm -hmm. wanting to do it. But he said, you know, Lil, like you're in a relationship with somebody that obviously wouldn't support that. And, you know, you're, you know, working at an office, like, you know, this is a whole like change of your life entirely. And I, I just, I wasn't ready. I wasn't ready. Um, but I did already, I, I, through every th- every step I ever did, I told my parents everything. I probably told my parents too much, like things that they probably didn't want to know, <laughs> you know? And I was just very, very open. I just always was like that. Yeah. So have you always had like a close relationship with them? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then were you surprised by your stepdad's reaction that he was supportive? Um, yes and no. Um, I think it's – it wasn't even – I'm trying to remember exactly, like, because it wasn't more support. It wasn't, like, excitement. It was more just, like, I am okay with you doing this. Mm-hmm. And, um, and he also was, like, into Sasha Gray and everything like that. So I remember him, like, having excitement because just about porn in general, but not necessarily about me doing porn, <laughs> if that makes sense. <laughs> oh, I think that makes a lot of yeah. sense. I think there's a lot of fathers out there yeah. who like porn, yeah. but they don't like the idea of their children doing mm-hmm. porn, and I think that that's pretty normal. Yes. Yeah. So, but my mom, she had a harder time with it. That, that was a little bit tougher for her. She, um, she's very involved with her friends and, you know, uh, just her community. And so it's always in her reflection on her, like what did maybe she do wrong in her line of parenting that caused me to stray to go and choose this, you mm-hmm. know, that that's always the reflection she felt that other people were thinking. Yeah. And, um, she's gotten a lot better at, closing that gap like when someone asks like well is Lily safe like what is you know she's quick to be like yes she's safe like she doesn't leave that hesitation because a lot of times in the beginning she wasn't sure she didn't know because she herself wasn't sure yeah so she just went oh yeah I think and then that's when it gave room for people to be more judgmental but now she really has seen me do this for four years she knows it's a real job she's watched it through and through and She's in just major support of it. I think she knows that it can be hard on me sometimes, obviously, mm-hmm. um, which she won't, wants me to watch because she's my mother and she cares. Um, but yeah, she's very supportive. I'm lucky. Yeah, yeah you are. Because really that is not. It's rarity. That is not common. No, I it's mean, not. It's so sad when I hear about performers whose parents like disown them because they do porn. And mm-hmm. I think like, some of the people that struggle the most in this industry are people who don't feel like they have a community or, or roots. Yeah. Um, you know, people who support them no matter what. And and that's really hard. Yeah. I think that that honestly leads to more mental health struggles kind of than anything else, like feeling like alone and yeah. unsupported. I mean, I have major mental health struggles. So if I didn't have my mom or, or yeah, I mean, I don't talk to my stepdad, actually. Um, we, we haven't spoken for a long time. But mm-hmm. um not to say that we might not one day, mm-hmm. just we're not right now. And right, right, okay. right. Um, but with my mom, yeah, it's nice. And my dad, you know, he's always kind of been spotty, like, in my life. He's not someone that's, like, super, super consistent, but he is a friend, and I really love him. But mm-hmm. it's not like somebody – like, my stepdad was my dad. Like, he was, like, my yeah. father. So, right, right. Okay. Yeah. So tell us about your first day – on set like actually okay. let's start off by how did you get into actually doing sex sure. scenes and then tell me about your very first one well okay so so to go back to um you know from camming to porn so I signed with OC when I signed with OC OC I, modeling OC modeling context. yes yeah I know it's so easy to fall into like our like a normal gym normal gym, yeah. like porn lingo yes. I gotta remember to tell yeah. the audience what we're talking well, about. Well, like I never used the word civilians before I got into porn and now that's something, and yeah, it's funny. Civil, again, for context, civilian is somebody who doesn't work in the porn industry. So like, say if you're a porn star and you're dating a civilian, it means you're dating someone who's not in porn. Yes. So. 
<laughs> um, but yeah, so when I signed uh, with Sandra from OC, um, I signed only girl, girl and solo mm-hmm. because I was still in a relationship, you know, and we would be, you know, drunk in a bar and he'd be like, swear, you'll never do boy, girl, swear, you'll never do boy, girl. I'm like, I swear, I swear. But I knew deep down that I wanted to and I was going to. Mm-hmm. And so when I found out that he was cheating on me, you know, we had just come back from Hawaii. I'm like, why are you taking me to Hawaii? Why aren't you buying me this Louis Vuitton bag? Like, what's happening? It was just guilt. So, you know, I, I it was like God handed me my job on a silver platter. You know, I, I opened up that computer. I saw the messages. I called Sandra right away. I said, sign me up for Boy Girl. This and is a sign. Like, yeah, <laughs> it was. Yeah. <laughs> and I was done. And so after that, uh, my first day on set was with Twisties. Actually, mm-hmm. it oh, was, okay. yeah, it was, uh, Charles, Charles shot it. Char- Charlie. Char- Charles Lightfoot. Yeah, yeah. 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 He shot it and it was with Giselle Palmer. Oh, yeah, that's yeah. a good person to like yeah. start off with. She's really sweet. She is. Yeah. And so, uh, that was my first scene. And then my second scene ever was kink. Uh, it was fucking machines. And I loved kink prior to getting into the industry. I, oh, okay. I wanted to shoot for fucking machines. That's like all I watched before getting into porn. Mm-hmm. So I wanted to do that. Mm-hmm. Um, and then that was my first two scenes. And then I think I came back and did Boy Girl the next time because I had already had that trip booked and everything. And then when I was doing that traveling, it was so hard to get scenes. Like, yeah. oh, that was awful. Yeah. <laughs> it was so awful. Yeah. Yeah, because also too, like people, because I know Sandra will send me, you know, girls that are in town and mm-hmm. – when I was shooting for Twisties, you know, we would book like two months ahead. Mm-hmm. So I'd be like, I, I've already completely booked out my, my that's schedule. That's why she's like, you have to live here. Like you, and that they're, yeah. they're not kidding when they say that. Like you need to be here yeah. mo- most of the time. Yeah. Yeah. So when did you decide to actually move here? Uh, so I moved during the pandemic, um, oh. which is a weird time to move. Yeah. How was that? <laughs> like, it was hard. Was it, oh God, I mean, was it easier to find places were like people leaving yeah because so, I know a lot of people left California yeah, during COVID there was there honestly there was a lot of places and the place that I got was cheaper because mm-hmm. of COVID so mm-hmm. like it was originally 1800 and then it was 1500 mm-hmm. and it was like on Hollywood Boulevard it had cockroaches that were like this big mm-hmm. oh my god I had a there were homeless people that would squat in the laundry room downstairs and I and I was in front of the laundry room so I'd hear them coming in and out of the oh, door geez. all day and then I remember my neighbor died across from me and I smelt his dead body like cooking in there. Oh! I know, that awful. I, I, I was like, because he was always in and out. I, kn- I knew him, you know, and he was coming in and out all the time. And the week before he got in a bloody fight where he was naked in the lobby. So like things were going down. Like and you were having like the fucking true Hollywood experience here. It was wild. And <laughs> and I remember my dog smelt it and I said, I was like, God, I haven't seen him for a while. I came back from Miami and sure enough, there was a coroner's seal on the door. And I was like, that's what I was smelling. Oh my God. Yeah, I know. Sorry. It was gross. Yeah. Oh. And I left after that. I, le- I went to a different apartment. And, yeah. Um, I can't imagine why. Yeah, yeah the energy was <laughs> off. Also like. The, the energy of in that apartment, like it was built in the 1920s. It had brick. You can't clean brick. I feel like brick just holds like a lot of different stuff. And I just felt like in that apartment, it's like where dreams came to die. Like yes. I just feel that uh, yes. heaviness. Yeah. Which is what some people call the porn industry, actually. Yeah. Where dreams go to die. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we have a lot of people that tried to act and then yeah. there they are. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, I mean, I don't know. For some people, it ended up being the better choice. 100%. And then another thing, too, is is like porn is all about acting now, which is like <laughs> Weird. Funny, right? Yeah, it's it's funny. Yeah, because for me, I mean, when I watch porn, I, if I ever heard anyone talk, I'm like, next. Like, yeah, I'm like I don't want to hear you try to speak. Like it's just <laughs> not. I'm good. <laughs> so wait, how do you feel now then that you're doing so many dialogue scenes? No, isn't that? I, I don't know. Because okay, so I was a theater kid growing up. Okay. So I was always into theater. I did my own little YouTube you know, shows like where I would have iMovie and I'd sit there and edit and like make my own little thing. So I always like did acting. um, But I just never thought that this is what I would be doing. Like Mm -hmm. when I worked for Lust Cinema, I had to audition and like read lines. And so like my mom helped me. And I I just remember thinking to myself, like I never would have thought that I'd have to audition for a porn role. Yeah. But that is kind of the way that things are happening. And yeah, I think it's cool, you know, because it kind of feels like, I don't know, I, I always felt like I would do like I've always been doing things like this so it's just like what I've always been doing in a way I guess yeah it it is interesting I mean seeing that evolution you know because we all know that I'm super old and I've been in the porn industry for a long time 
And there is a lot of yeah. like, you know, features and a lot of acting where, yeah. I mean, Gonzo was the thing in the like 2000s. Right. You know, no, no speaking at all. And mm-hmm. now there's a lot of it. And um, it's funny because, you know, from the production end, <laughs> it takes so much longer to Mm -hmm. shoot the dialogue than Mm -hmm. it does to shoot the sex. Like that's like kind of the big joke. And then the other big joke is like, we're spending 10 hours shooting the one part that everyone's going to fast forward through. But that's obviously like not true Mm -hmm. because, you know, all these companies are data driven. So they know if people are not watching like the dialogue part. And clearly there's enough people who are, who are interested and invested in the stories and are are paying for it to Mm -hmm. make it worth that because it does cost more to shoot a scene with dialogue than it does to shoot it without yeah like i heard with nubiles uh that's like part of the main thing that people watch is the beginning and Mm -hmm. then like what that's why when they upload it on pornhub part of the reason is there's only like a little bit of sex well obviously because they want to draw it there. but um i just remember someone saying on nubiles set that like one of the main things that they watch is the intro and Mm -hmm. i just was like why i just don't understand but i guess I also don't understand stepsis porn and why people are into that. So, you know, it's like, I, okay, yeah. <laughs> One of those mysteries of human, human uh, desires. I yeah. mean, I think people like context. Yeah. You know, they want to know, like, why are these people getting together? It makes it more interesting. Right. Especially if you watch a lot of porn. I mean, you know, reverse cowgirls, reverse cowgirl. Yeah. And doggies, doggy. Like, why are these people having sex? That's... Yeah. You know, more interesting. Right. And also I will say like from a production, you know, I mean, on one hand, shooting features, I would curse because it would take so much longer. Yeah. But on the other hand, like when it was done and edited, like that was exciting. Mm-hmm. And of course, that was the only parts I would watch. Yeah. You know, when I would re- have to review something, um, I'd watch the intro mm-hmm. and that would be like really cool to see the way it came together. And then when it came to the sex, I was like, yeah, <laughs> stop. Like, I don't care about that part. Like all of that's very, you know. Well, and back in the day, didn't things go on Showtime and stuff like that? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, Showtime, I don't know if they still do. Showtime bought a couple of my movies. Like Wicked, too? Yeah. So, well, so Showtime, because I've had a couple movies go to Showtime, Mm -hmm. and it was stuff that I shot for Wicked. So Wicked had a deal with them, and I think Showtime bought like 10 movies from them a year or something like Mm -hmm. that. But they would pick which ones they want. Mm -hmm. So um, that's why we had to shoot all that fucking softcore (laughs) Which I was love softcore. Such yeah. a, do you? No, oh, say it was just, Some people do. Yeah. Some um, people do because they feel like that's the time that they don't have to open up the camera. I guess I don't mind it like that, but I mean, I've just dealt with a lot of things with softcore where like it's not really softcore. Mm. So it's like, you know, I remember my first situation I had with softcore, um, I looked out at all of the men in the room. I think it was like my sixth scene. I said, uh, what's softcore? And they said, oh, it's just we don't show the penis going in. And I said, oh, okay. And then that male talent proceeded to fuck me a whole second time, like multiple positions. And that whole, and I mean, I'm new, so I had multiple scenes that I was shooting where I was flying in. And I think I had like two more boy girl scenes. Um, and I, my vagina could not handle, I did not need to, to do that. Yeah. And then I went home and I remember the PA messaged me and said, hey, I'm not sure if you know this, but um, you're not actually, you don't have to have the penis in you when you're doing softcore. I just wanted to let you know that. And I said, I would have really liked if someone would have told me that because there, I wouldn't, I didn't want to have sex that second time. And yeah. so now, you know, if you have another new girl on set, please tell her that because I, didn't need it. Yeah. 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 I mean, there's a, uh, it's a lot of wear and tear on the body. Yeah. And it was, it was, I mean, it's, it's also like, I was so new. Like I had, I really got slutted out in this industry. Like before getting into porn, I mean, I only had sex with seven people. Like I was not, I was very monogamous. Like I, I just was like in a frenzy when I came here, I was like, Oh my God. And I've never had sex with a dick that big. And then I'm not having sex for like 15 minutes at home. I'm having sex for 35 minutes and then on top of that he did another soft course you know yeah you know so it's like whoa you know I did it and like I do things all the time that shock me where I'm like god I did that you know like my body is crazy resilient it's insane the stuff that I've put myself through and then what I will also continue to put my body through it's yeah. like it's kind of beautiful to know that my body can do all this but at the same time like my body's tired yeah yeah what has been one of those things that surprised you like what scene have you done or what act did you do where you're like wow that 
probably like, uh, when I pat I, myself on the back. Yeah, I took that dick. <laughs> probably when, anytime I've worked with Anton for sure. Um, but uh, the first time when I did my first black scene, it was with this guy named Sly Diggler. And he's not around anymore. Mm -hmm. But I remember just being like, and he was younger than me too. That's what was so weird. Is like so like the guy was younger, and he's yeah, like this. Because you're not old. I'm 27, so I'm yeah. I'm, you're I'm not, not old. Yeah, That's yeah. I mean, to me, you're yeah, young. Yes, so. yeah. I was 23, 24 at the time though, and so he was 21. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and I just remember being like, wow, that that was crazy. I couldn't believe. And then once I did that. I was like, you're, you're fine. Like, you can take really anything. No, mm -hmm. no dick really scared me after that. Yeah. Yeah, because I think that was my first big one. But, I, I mean, my first first real big dick, I think, might have been Ricky Johnson. Mm. Yeah, and that was just, like, a random POV scene for mofos. It wasn't anything, like, special or anything. And I remember mm. I bled, but I had an IUD in, mm. and that IUD went horribly wrong inside my body, like, a couple months later, and I had oh. to have, like, liposcopic surgery. I had gonorrhea that went undetected in my system, oh, God. and, like, it got attached to my IUD, and I had pelvic inflammatory disease, and I had to be in a hospital for, like, a week, and... um my abdomen filled up with like a liter of pus and fluid and my white cell blood count was like at 44, which is like what people with leukemia have and they couldn't figure out what was wrong with me and oh it was gonorrhea God. that went undetected. And um, yeah, that, that that was like when my career, I felt like my career was gonna get ripped away from me. I was brand new. I, I had maybe like eight, nine scenes that I mm -hmm. shot and then um, I got really sick and I, yeah, it was really, really shitty. And then I, I came back. Uh, I tried to work a little bit again in February um, after healing. I did go to AVN 2020. And then I went, uh, and then right after that, um, COVID hit. Yeah. And then I then when COVID was hitting, uh, Sandra was like, you said you were going to move. Are you going to move? The industry is opening back up in June, July. Did it open up? J J June? I think so. Like yeah. limited. Yeah. I mean, I remember like for Twisties, we it was so crazy. Like we'd go there before the talent got there. We'd like set up a cell phone on a fucking tripod and then we'd have to leave and then they'd come and they'd have to press record and <laughs> they'd have to like call us and tell. It was like this whole thing. It was such a. Well, I shot a Twisties solo for during the. Yeah, we time. probably. Yeah. Oh, I think we got that from you. Yeah. Because yeah, <laughs> I was managing all of that. Yeah. So like uh, performers were doing self-shot mm -hmm. content and yeah. then we were like buying it from them because right. we couldn't shoot. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That was in my Hollywood apartment, I remember. Oh. I, I had just moved. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um. Mm -hmm. So just I want to go back real quick mm -hmm. to you being in the hospital yeah. and getting sick like that. I yeah. mean, that's that's pretty traumatic. Yeah. Was, was there like, did that kind of make you rethink your career choice? It did. But um, at that point, I had already, um, I just, I already started. Yeah, You know, I was like, you, you already started doing this. So I just was like, I didn't want to stop. And like, I just, yeah, I just, there was, I just felt like it was getting ripped away from me and mm -hmm. I wasn't ready to have it ripped away from me yet. Mm -hmm. Like, I just remember sitting there having to cancel everything and being pretty devastated and like, uh, you know, I, I didn't really understand the trauma of it until later, mm -hmm. you know, it didn't really set in how how bad that was, you know? Mm -hmm. And then when I moved here to LA and then I realized like this stuff with my body doesn't end, you mm -hmm. know, like I, I had that one thing happen, but now like there's all these other things that still happen. You know, you mm -hmm. get strep throat, you get pink eye, you get mm -hmm. you know, all these different types of things that can happen. So it's just like, you know, it really never ends, you know? And then if you, and then you just have to constantly be taking care of yourself like mm -hmm. all the time and you can't forget one day or else it can. Yeah. Yeah. You always have to be clean. You're always having to be hygienic. Like there's just all these things you have to always be thinking about when you're shooting. Yeah. And, um, yeah, I think that was just kind of like a major realization and shock. Like that, like, that what what I went through obviously didn't happen again. Um, I did have something kind of happen again that was odd. When I tried to come back and shoot in February, my body wasn't fully healed. And I remember I had a spark of pelvic inflammatory disease. I don't know. I just started profusely vomiting one night when I was staying in the valley. And then I ha had to go to Kaiser and they gave me a steroid shot in my ass. And then I was fine. Mm -hmm. And then I went back home and I healed longer. Didn't have any sex. I was celibate. And then, um, well, I had condom sex with my sugar daddy because that's how I got money to live here in L.A. Mm -hmm. So then that was the one person I was having sex with. Um, 
And then luckily because of COVID, I think my body was able to heal, Mm -hmm. you know? And then when I moved out here in June, I just started shooting and it was kind of like it never happened, yeah. which was odd. But yeah. I always have that fear and that trauma of like, if I have a cramp or if I have like, mm-hmm. I'm like, oh my God, is it happening again? But I think what happened to me was like, it was such a rarity. Like it was, yeah. it was a, I don't know what the word I'm trying to look for, but it, it was a, like not a fluke act, but it was, it was, it doesn't happen to a lot of people. So yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, it sounds like, you know, I mean, I know that working in the adult industry, it's like one of those you get to really know your body yeah. like very well mm-hmm. and you do have to take care of yourself mm-hmm. because it is a, you know, it's a physically taxing job in a lot yeah. of ways. You're an Internally athlete. and externally. Yeah. yeah. You are. Yeah. It's like, I, you know, you need to stretch, you need to work out, you need to take care of yourself, you need to brush your tongue, you need to wipe your asshole not once, but like 20 times, you know, it's like- <laughs> Get a bidet. All, literally, like there's just, every part of you has to be scraped out, cleaned, and ready, you know? And then there's nothing worse than like, when you're working with someone, like when you're new, and I, I sometimes when I work with new girls and they have hygiene that isn't perfectly- perfect I don't think anything of it because I know that they'll learn Mm -hmm. like it takes a second sometimes yeah but it's like it's super important yeah oh god it's so important yeah yeah all right guys we're gonna take a quick commercial break and then we'll be right back so stick around we'll see you in a sec this episode of Holly Randall and Filtered is brought to you by Adam and Eve who wants better sex and who wants to start having better sex immediately The best way to get started is to go to adamandeve.com right now, the online superstore for everything sexy. They are offering 50% off of any one item. Plus, when you select your one item, you will also get three special bonus gifts that includes an item for him, a special toy for her, and something we know you'll both enjoy. Also, get six free movies and free discreet shipping. But you can only get the special offer when you go to adamandeve.com and use code HOLLY. So be sure to use code HOLLY to get your 50% discount, 10 free gifts, and free shipping today. Hello, everybody. We are back. So, Lily, I know that we talked about um, your family a little bit at the beginning. Mm -hmm. But per our last interview, which, you know, was only streamed live on Instagram, um, you mentioned that your dad is gay. Yes. And I think that's an incredibly interesting and unusual Mm -hmm. um, circumstance. I can't recall the last person I had on who you know, had that story. Right. So tell us about your father. Yeah. My dad um, is a wonderful man. Um, I love him a lot. He and my mom met in college at Oregon State University. He was a fraternity guy and my mom was in a sorority. Um, They were both just like best friends. And then they were married for a really, really long time. I think my mom was like blinded by the fact that like because my dad had a really big, big family. My mom didn't have a big family, so she kind of just wanted that. And then they didn't have sex a lot. I mean, they only had sex like 10 times during their marriage and had me and my sister, which is pretty crazy. Like, that shows how fertile my mom was. And that, like, yeah, very, very odd. Um, But, yeah, had me and my sister. Uh, He divorced my mom when I I was three. Mm -hmm. Um, My stepdad came into my life very quickly, like right at right at three, kind of rescued my mom Mm -hmm. and did like, you know, white knight saving Mm -hmm. all that type of thing. Um, But my dad, uh, you know, I we're just not super close. We're close, but not in the way where like we call every day. Like there's sometimes like a month or two where he'll like forget to call me. And it's not in a malicious way. It's more just like, oh, shit. Sorry, hon. I forgot to call you for two months. Like it's not even like and I don't. So that's why I don't have like um, any animosity towards him with it. But does it hurt me a little bit? Sure. It'd be nice if he called like a little bit more, but mm-hmm. like that's not a big deal because I also had my stepfather in my life that was always a constant. Mm-hmm. So, um, but with my dad, you know, he's has a partner that he's been with that partner that I love uh, since I've been like 14. Um, I don't think they're married quite yet. Um, I don't, I don't know if they are actually ever going to get married. Mm-hmm. I'm not sure. Um, yeah. But uh, yeah. Oh my God. I'm so sorry. They are, they're, uh, engaged. I don't know why that just like slipped my mind. They, uh, they got engaged during COVID and it was, um, super private. They didn't tell mm-hmm. anybody. And okay. they, yeah. Cause they were, they didn't think it was a big deal. Cause they were like, we've been together this long. It's basically like we already are engaged. Yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, so that's, that's kind of about my dad. Yeah. So how <laughs> did you, I mean, 
when your father divorced your mom, mm -hmm. was it because he was gay? Yeah. Like, did he acknowledge that with her? Yes. Yeah. And then how do you think, I mean, I know you were three, mm -hmm. but has she ever talked about it? Like, how did she take that? Oh, it fucked her up. Oh, it was bad. You know, it, did she have any idea? No, no, she really didn't. And if you met my dad, you would have no idea. Yeah. You know, it just, there's no stereotypicalness of him mm -hmm. that is gay. Like you just would never know. It's so, like when I went to an art school, you know, I had a lot of people that are like, oh, your dad's gay. Like he takes you shopping. He does this, he does this. I'm like, no, <laughs> you know, my dad is not that kind of gay dad mm -hmm. like he's more like he can bake but then I guess that's like where we're trying to do stereotypes yeah yeah, yeah yeah um no it, it was really hard on my mom I mean it was back when like she thought it was her fault you know she didn't yeah. realize that you know you're born that way mm -hmm. and all that stuff you know she was she even went to the library to look up what being homosexual really meant. Like, she didn't really even understand it fully. And I remember her saying that to me. I was like, this is in the 90s, though. Like, you, what do you mean you didn't fully understand it? Yeah. Um, and I remember uh, her doctor telling her that she needed to get tested for HIV and different things like that because was unsure if there was cheating. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he swore he never cheated. I'm sure there was some experimenting that went on. You can't yeah. Uh, not. Yeah. yeah, I feel like you can't. Yeah. Yeah, you got to, like, try that. My dad also. To make sure that it fits. Yes, and my dad knew he was gay. I remember him telling me, him and a boy, when they were really young, playing with each other. You know, like, you start doing things like, you know, like, he, mm -hmm. he always knew. So, um, but he, you know, had a Republican father, and he yeah. wanted to, you know, he was part of the family business, and he would just try to push that down so much. I mean, he, he even beat up gay uh, kids when he was younger because he was gay. You know, it's like that classic, you yeah, want to beat it out of you. Yeah. kind of thing. Mm -hmm. When did you find out that he was gay? Because I was imagine at three, it's too young for you to even process what that means. Was it like a sit down conversation that someone had to have with you? Or was it just one of those things that you kind of grew up knowing and wasn't a big deal? Um, I, so I, it was always something I knew. Yeah. My, my dad always explained it to me. I remember, well, this is kind of how it, I, this was a very formative thing that happened. I found my dad's gay porn and mm. I found a couple of his dildos and stuff. And I came home, I think I was like five or six and I was talking about it. Mm -hmm. My mom was livid, you know, and, you know, screamed at my dad. And my dad was like, well, I didn't know she was going through my cabinets. And it's like, well, you know, I'm a curious kid. And I'm, yeah. yeah. So I, and my dad was also like, he's very crass. Like, he's just very open. And like, that's fine. But sometimes it would be like too much. Like, he'd come back from Palm Springs and I'd get into the car and he'd be like, well, daddy had a lot of fun at Palm Springs this weekend. <laughs> I'm like, great. I'm like, I don't really need to know that. So like one person would say like a kind of innuendo comment and he would take it and then just really throw it out there. And you're just yeah. like, Jeff, Jesus Christ. Yeah. yeah. My so, dad was kind of like that. Too. Yeah. So I get it. Um, all right. Let's talk about, uh, you've actually described your parents as butt sluts before. I can't believe I've even said that. That's what like, is they that? would kill me if they knew I talked like that about well, hopefully them. Hopefully they don't want to watch yeah. the show. My dad would my dad would laugh. My mom would be a little embarrassed. Yeah. Um I guess I get the butt slut thing with your dad. Yeah. But your mom? So my mom so here's the thing. When you you're with a gay man for, you know, ten years, you you know, she was so sexually repressed. Mm -hmm. And when she met my stepfather, I think that's when that repression kind of lifted and mm -hmm. they started doing some fun things. And like, I know my mom, we got drunk in Mexico. And so she told me that she fisted her own asshole. <laughs> and so I was like, oh, yay. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> like, if you're capable of that and Whoa. my dad's capable, I'm like, I know I'm capable of. Okay. Being so that made you believe in yourself? <laughs> No, it, it really did. That's, oh a, that's God, like, it was it. a solidifying. I was like, oh, okay, then <gasps> that means, yeah. Yeah, that's so funny. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Runs in the family. Yes, exactly. But she's she's pretty private about sex, but yet she is a very sexual person. Mm -hmm. It's interesting. Like, my mom, like, I remember we went to Shasta Lake, and I was four, and, you know, someone has a camera recorder out, and she flashes the camera recorder, and she's like, Shasta, you know, year, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, baby. And I remember I just start sobbing. Like, I'm like, 
can't believe that my mother would do something so slutty, you know, and I, at an age four, I'm realizing that. And I remember my mom being drunk, like, oh, stop, like, it's <laughs> fine. And like now thinking of like what I do now and everything. It's yeah. just like, oh, but. Ironic, right? Yeah, yeah, it is. Do you think that your mom opened up to you about the butt fisting? Was this when she knew that you were working in the porn industry? This is when I started camming. Okay. So yeah, I think she probably opened up of that because I started talking about sex work and mm-hmm. started being a little more open. Yeah. And then also when my my mom is drinking, she'll just say things. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it applies to a lot of us. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Do, do now that you work in the porn industry, does your mom ever like come to you for like sex advice or anything like that? Yes and no. Um, she doesn't. She's not. She's not. Uh, this is what's really weird about my mom. I tell my mom everything. Okay. Mm-hmm. She doesn't tell me everything. So, like, months sometimes will go by where she is hooked up with someone, and then she's like, oh, yeah, I had sex with somebody, like, eight months ago, and I just never told you. And I'm like, what? Like, I tell you the second, you know, she's like, oh, I just didn't think it was worth mentioning, and I just didn't want to say anything. And I'm like, what do you mean? Like, it's like, because I'm just so open. The moment something happens, I just want to tell somebody. But do you think it's because she's your mother and she feels like she shouldn't tell you? I mean, it sounds like you guys kind of have, like, like a friendship. Yeah. You know what I mean? To be honest, like, I don't mean to get too intense right now, but I think there's some, uh, you know, trauma, sexual trauma that has caused my mom to not be as open with certain things. Mm -hmm. She, you know, hasn't healed from certain things that have happened to her. And I think I've noticed that be a cause as to why she is sometimes private about sex out of nowhere. Mm -hmm. Because I, uh, sometimes she's not and sometimes she is. And I wonder where that comes from. And I think it's, because there's some stuff that's happened that she needs to heal from. Yeah. Yeah. Isn't it interesting when we get older and we start to see our parents not as these like all-knowing beings, which they are when we're children, you know, mm-hmm. but as like real human beings and seeing like their flaws and seeing their limitations and considering the things that happened to them when they were younger that yeah. shaped them into being like who they are today. Because yeah. I mean, I had something, you know, pretty bad happen to me and I needed my mom and you know, usually my mom is there for me and this was a situation where it was too hard for her to be there for me and I didn't understand why and I was just like why can't she be there for me with my assault like what's like you mm-hmm. know and it's because she hasn't dealt with the trauma of her assault yeah it's gotta be and then that was a heavy thing to recognize that like even though she's my mom and I need her for this I also am an adult woman and understand that she can't yeah like she's doing the best she can with yeah. what she's got yeah that's like I think one of the emotionally most emotionally mature things that we can recognize is and also like kind of forgiving our parents for you know things that maybe we felt like they did to us when we were younger or didn't do for us when we were younger and then you know coming to recognize that yeah everybody's just doing the best with what they what they got yeah and not everybody has great coping skills right or we're taught you know how to manage things when they were younger Mm -hmm. Yeah, I so. still hold a lot of resentment, which I don't like. And I think with age, that'll go away, yeah. I hope. You yeah. Know? Um, but I've been working on it. And, you know, I think me also moving away, like my mom and I are very codependent on one another. Mm-hmm. And so when I moved, um, that really changed our relationship for the better, I think. Yeah. Yeah, because now, you know, we're both – Oh, we still FaceTime like 24-7, and we're still like always involved in each other's lives. But – um. Yeah. I don't know. My mom and I, we have a oh, somewhat of a toxic relationship, I would say. We're a very tumultuous relationship. Um, but it, yeah, it has gotten better overall. Yeah. yeah. I think that will change as you get older. I know my yeah. relationship with my mom has changed. It's gone through a lot of changes mm-hmm. as I've gotten older. Yeah. So, you know. For the better? Yes and no. Yeah. I mean. Well, and then now you have a baby too, which mm-hmm. is an interesting factor to add in as well yeah Yeah. I mean my so I started off in the adult industry working for my mom Mm -hmm. um and at first that was great and then it got difficult especially like when the model used to started to change of like the internet and everything like Mm -hmm. that so when we started photos were you know pretty much all anybody could download there Mm -hmm. was no video streaming and stuff like that Mm because bandwidth wasn't good enough so we did like really well because my mom was a photographer really And then when it started to shift and I started to see that we needed to move towards video, Mm -hmm. I started to push the need to shoot video. She didn't want to shoot video. Mm -hmm. So that was the beginning of us starting to butt heads. Okay. Um, And so we just, like, we fought a lot. Yeah. Um, And then when I finally, like, stopped working for her and started my own business, 
that changed our relationship for the better mm -hmm. because like if I'm too involved with her, it's, it's hard. She's a lot like yeah. she's an intense person. Right. Um, and, uh, so, and now that I, and I moved back in with my parents two years ago, yeah, mm -hmm. like two years ago to help take care of my dad before he passed. Mm -hmm. Um, and I'm still there and I, now I don't see myself leaving cause like I can't leave my mom alone, Yeah, but it is harder. I feel like a relationship is, is harder now that I live with her again mm -hmm. because she's like, it's right. She's right there. She's right there. Yeah. And she's very needy mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and it's like a lot, yeah. you know, and I have a kid, Yeah, um, which actually I think is kind of helpful. Does she help with the kid a lot? I mean, she does her best. Mm -hmm. She reads her bedtime stories every night. Okay. My mom is not the greatest babysitter. Okay. She loses focus. Mm -hmm. She has ADHD. Yeah. She sometimes doesn't enforce, you know, like the boundaries yeah. that we're trying to establish mm -hmm. with a willful toddler and you have to be consistent. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, you know, she's uh, she has her limitations. That's funny because I'm sure she's like, well, I raised you, so I'm sure I can do it. It's and fun. look how I turned out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I actually like sometimes I'm shocked at you know, like I can't go to my mom for advice mm -hmm. about my kid because she like doesn't remember how she raised me. Wow. Like I swear, she's just like. like it's a blur, yeah. Yeah, she's just like, I don't know. Mm -hmm. Like we just did whatever we did. So right. like it's weird. It's like mm -hmm. she's forgotten that yeah. part. So I can't really ask her about it. But I have to say it is difficult sometimes because, you know, like Violet is – um you know, she's a toddler, so she's hitting that mm -hmm. willful stage where mm -hmm. she pushes back a lot. She's testing boundaries and stuff like that. So um, she's been a challenge lately. Yeah. And sometimes I get this weird projection where I'm like, I'll take something personally that mm -hmm. she does, but she's two and a half. Right. You know, like I shouldn't take anything personally, but it's yeah. hard. And I'll, and I'll think to myself, oh, my God she already like thinks I'm as annoying as I think my mom is. Yeah. <laughs> so and I'll just be like, and sometimes I'll hold her. Like I read her a story every night and I like hold her and rock her to bed and I'll hold her and I'll be like, I won't be able to hold her like this always. Mm -hmm. Like there'll be a time where she doesn't want me to like yeah. hug her anymore. And she'll kind of like, push me away a little bit the way that I push my mom away sometimes, mm -hmm. but that still doesn't change my behavior towards my mom. Yeah. Which sucks. Mm -hmm. Like I recognize it sometimes. I'm like, I should be kinder and not that I'm mean to her, but you know, like sometimes I just, I think it's just cause I need my space mm -hmm. and I don't have any. So I think if I didn't live with her and I have more space, then it would be easier for me to be like more affectionate with her. But because she's like always You're just on top of each other. Yeah. yeah, it's harder for me, but it's but it, it's like I'll recognize that that disconnect between my mom and I, and I'll be concerned about that being the future with me and Violet. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't change my behavior towards my mom, even though it should. Right. Because like now I kind of know what it might feel like. I don't know if that makes any mm -hmm. sense. Yeah, it's kind of weird. Well, and it, and I, it makes sense, and it's also like when your your child has a full, fresh, like clean slate, just mm -hmm. like you did when you were a baby or mm -hmm. like all of us did. So it's like when your child comes to you and needs, you know, something and then you're, you know, like, oh, I, I can't do that right now or whatever. Like your child doesn't really understand that like you have like different emotional problems because that child is brand new to the world. So they don't have those problems that you have. So they're coming to you with full love and light and then they just get shut down. And then that's when those problems start to then get recreated in the child. Yeah. You know, like it's that, that whole cycle pattern. I'm not saying this very eloquently, but like it's, you know. I, yeah. Well, I mean, it's, and, and that's, <laughs> that's where like all of this, you know, newfound therapy mm -hmm. and like guidance and ch child raising comes in because it's all about like breaking that cycle yeah. right? and not making the mistakes that our parents made. I mean, yeah. honestly, like my parents were great parents. I had a good childhood. I mm -hmm. don't feel, I mean, look, there's certain things that, you know, my, my parents did my mother more specifically, I wouldn't say traumatized me, but definitely like shaped me in certain ways that are not mm -hmm. great. Mm -hmm. Um, and I'm so, cognizant of that and I yeah. don't want to do that to Violet yeah to the point where like I get paranoid yeah. about like everything that I do you know like is this gonna affect her in this way like I'm so You're the aware of it of, yeah. yeah 
-hmm. and like trying to follow the gentle parenting thing. I mean, I'm not even kidding. When I was getting ready for this podcast, Mm -hmm. I was listening. I bought the the Big Little Feelings Mm -hmm. (laughs) workshop, like toddler workshop thing online. And I was like watching it as I was getting ready because I, you know, I want to make sure that I raise her right. But of course, I'm human. It's not, it can't be perfect. Yeah. What can you do? I mean, you just do your best. That's do your best. That's, that's all. Yeah. yeah. Anyways, wow, we really went on a tangent. Yeah. <laughs> um, let's talk about your pubic hair. <laughs> sure. That sounds good. Yeah. Let's <laughs> well, all other tangent. Um, your yeah, bush is pubes. one of your signature qualities. <laughs> it is. Um, when did you decide to embrace the bush? Well, um, I'm just also, well, first of all, I'm a very hairy girl. So, like, managing hair is frustrating. Are you? Yeah, I have, I have a lot of hair. I mean, I'm like, I have dark, natural dark hair. I know I'm blonde, but, like, my underneath is dark. And, like, I have, like, three hairs. It'll grow out of, like, one follicle in my mm-hmm. bush area. Like, I'm, mm-hmm. I don't know. I don't know where it comes from. I'm, like, Polish and German, so I don't know if. Polish and German people aren't necessarily hairy. Do you hairy. think your arms are hairy? Is that why you were, like, looking at them? Yeah, they are. They Can are. I see? Let me see. Yeah, they are pretty hairy. I mean, I used to shave them. No, my arms are pretty. Okay, yeah, well, they're comparable. Every uh, every guy I've dated, except the one I'm dating now, I've had hairier arms than him. Mm. And I'm, like, always, like, oh, you know. <laughs> really? <laughs> I have hairier arms than you. Yeah, <laughs> and I'm, like, oh, no. Yeah, I yeah. don't have that problem with my husband. He is yeah. covered in body hair. Yeah. I'm good. Yeah, I'm good. Exactly. I, feel, I feel naked next to him. <laughs> no, but I, um, yeah, my bush, I just... Yeah, I, I guess for me, this is my main thing with my bush is it's an, it's a major feminist statement for me because mm. real women have hair, mm-hmm. you know, and I think a lot of women's beauty standards are rooted in pedophilia. You know, you're always needing to be clean and young looking and tight and all this stuff. Mm-hmm. And like, I just don't think that that's what a real woman is. So I like to have hair. Do you think that's also connected to the fact that like you, I mean, you do, you have a young look. I do. It's it is my stick stick, I guess. Uh, but it's not necessarily like something that I play on. I guess. Yeah. You know? But what I mean is, like, do you think that you embrace the bush more to kind of yeah like, counteract kind of? Sure. Oh, yeah. I like. Okay. So. I, I don't like doing, like, young scenes or whatever. Like, if I have to lie and say I'm 19, like, I don't like doing that. It mm-hmm. makes me uncomfortable, and I would probably say I don't want to do that. Mm-hmm. Um, and I actually – and I know I say I don't want to do that because mm-hmm. it's just not um, – and especially now being 27, it just doesn't really make sense. But at 23, when I started, you know, I did. Um, but I also just – that was, like, when I – it wasn't really just to not look young. It was because I just was such, it was my feminist era. I was like coming into everything. And like, it was just like all this different sex work that I was doing and just all in the, you know, the me too movement, all this stuff Mm -hmm. that just, just like women power, you know? Mm -hmm. So I just kind of like, I'm going to have a bush. And if someone doesn't like it, they can go fuck themselves. You know, like it's just, that's my thing. Yeah. And, um, I like to tug on it too. I think that's fun. I think it's fun to play with. It's almost like a stress ball. Sometimes like I'll sit there and like, (laughs) Play with it, you know? Um, but now it's like everybody and their sister has a bush. It's mm-hmm. like it's back, you know? Yeah. Um, which is cool to see because it's like, yeah, let's just have it. But now here's the thing. Anywhere your face would be, I don't usually have hair because mm-hmm. I want that to be hairless because I like to be eaten out and all that so other stuff. So the undercarriage you keep clean. Yes. Yeah, I think most most women do that. Yeah. But I did have sex with Brooklyn Gray when she had like a full bush. Mm-hmm. And because it was full and longer, it was soft, mm-hmm. you know, so it was really hot. But like that in between. Yeah. It cannot. Yeah. Yeah. You get like razor burn. Yeah. Like I remember my ex being like, I'd rather have you either fully hairy or nothing at all because the in between between shit I cannot do. It's, yeah. <laughs> cuts my dick. Yeah. <laughs> you mentioned in another interview that we are in the revolution of the bush. Yeah. Why do you think that is? I think it has to do with trends. I think, I think trends is a big thing. I think because, uh, you, we see a lot of girls doing it. I think that, you know, they go, Oh, well I can start doing that too. Um, I think that's a big factor. And then I also think because I don't know, it's sexy. It's just like, and I, I, I personally think it has to do a lot with feminism. Mm. I really do. But maybe that that is just me. I'm not sure. I just feel like it's like, I think a lot of, because we see a lot of women growing out their armpit hair. We I was see, just going to you know, say like that. It, like, it, that's been kind of a new thing, too, yeah. that I've seen kind of come and go. And yeah. 
How do you feel about that? I think it's hot. It's not necessarily something that I personally would do. I do it when I'm not shooting. Mm -hmm. Like, my armpit hair, I just let it grow. Same with my leg hair. Like, I just don't care, Mm -hmm. you know? Um, And I guess if it wasn't for the male gaze, I wouldn't shave anything Mm -hmm. at all, you know? So I guess why I keep this is just a little fuck you to the male gaze. Yeah. But then, you know, some guys like it, so then that's cool, you know? Right. And and I'm down for that when guys like it because – you're, I think you're a real man if you like that. Yeah, you know? I think a lot of guys like it. It's more it's more common than not. Yeah. And, and now my bush is a little too much. Like, I've been talking about it sometimes on set because, like, it's just a little too out there. Like, there's really no containing it. And I don't have any <laughs> curls, so it kind of just, like, well, is it's like pro- this. <laughs> it's a problem, too, if you want to wear, like, a really small bikini bottom or something oh, like that. when I was in the Dominican Republic, I'm literally, like, and, you know, I'm walking up to the bar and I'm, like, <laughs> and people are staring at me and I'm, like, mm, it's okay. <laughs> yeah, it's so bad. It just looks embarrassing. Yeah. So I'm going to need to trim it a little bit. So speaking of, you've actually talked about having aspirations to go do work behind the camera. Mm-hmm. So tell us a little bit about that. Well, you know, I think I mentioned earlier how I used to do my own film and I mm-hmm. went to an art school. So like I made my own little movies and I'd edit them and all that stuff. Um, for me, like... I don't know necessarily because like directing is a big, big job. I'd like to dip my toe and see if that's what's right for me. But I'd also like to see what else could be right for me. Mm -hmm. Like I used to I did darkroom photography for like six years. Mm -hmm. And so I've always been a really good photographer. And that's something that I would love to get back into. Um, But I feel like also everybody and their sister is a photographer now, too, is like everyone's a makeup artist. Like everybody, you know, is like but at the same time, like if I want to do something, then I can. There's no reason why I can't. Yeah. Um. And so I do want to eventually get behind the camera because I feel like that's just where my life is leading. Everything that um, happens in my life, I never have to really, like, it just kind of happens. Like, Mm -hmm. the porn thing, like, you know, it just happened. Like, I found those messages. I called. I made it happen. Here here I am. So, like, when I'm meant to be behind the camera, that opportunity, I think, will present itself. Mm -hmm. And then I will go for it. If it doesn't, we'll see. But I know I'm a little bit away from that. Like, I've noticed I really enjoy writing scripts. When I wrote that script, like, I really was into that. And I really like creative writing. So that's always Mm -hmm. something that, you know, I can do. So there's a couple things that I want to do behind the camera besides just directing. And I kind of want to dip my toe in each of those little things before I figured out, like, I even, I, I've said this a couple of times, but, like, I've wanted to PA. Like, I've wanted to do, like, another job on set besides, you know, but I've, I've always heard that, like, people make judgments about, like, well, if a female talent starts doing that type of stuff, maybe she isn't shooting as much or, like, maybe she isn't. And it's, mm. like, I don't think it has to be looked at like that. I think that's just hearsay. Like, people can do whatever the fuck they want. And if they want to go and try a couple days of doing that, then that's completely okay. I think it's great to start with PAing because, I mean, that's how you learn. It's how, the foundation of everything. Yeah. yeah. I mean, because being a model, like you're not going to be able to absorb all that information because your job is to be there yeah. and to perform. Right. So, you know, being a PA, I think, is definitely like a more, um, yeah, I mean, it's a great introduction. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, you know, the person that I am dating, I definitely feel like I met him for a reason. Mm-hmm. Like, like the way that I was saying that people come into my life and things come into my life for a reason. I don't have to really search for them. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, I feel like I met him for a reason as well. And like, he's taught me a lot of stuff and Mm -hmm. that's really exciting. Um, It's also something that I was very resistant towards because I want to learn on my own and Mm -hmm. I don't want anyone else to be the influence as to why I learned that, you Mm -hmm. know, and he tried to let me know, like, where else are you going to learn from? Mm-hmm. Like I'm right here, you yeah. Know? And I'm like, I know, but I want to learn on my own. <laughs> you know. Do you feel like you would then maybe owe him something? Like if you became successful or started working, and then you would feel like you, or like he would try to claim no your knowledge or your success. Per- mm, no, he's not that type of person. Mm-hmm. No, I, I don't. I don't think so. I don't think I would owe him anything at all. No. I. I what I'm worried about is everybody else of being like, well, she's only doing that because, you know, 
she got that because, you know, and that's just, and here's the thing. That's just the name of the game in this industry. Yeah. I mean, like I only got to where I'm at because of my mom. Right. Like if anyone's, you know, like I wrote in on Suze Randall's coattails, there's no fucking denying that. Yeah. Like at all. So, you know, and I'm sure that people at the beginning of my career said, you know, oh, well, she's only doing this because and it's 100 percent true. My mm-hmm. mom, like, gave me her knowledge, her assistance, her mm-hmm. cameras, her sets, her studio, all that stuff. But I also, like, worked really hard to, you know, stay where I'm at and to also, you know, like, you to prove succeed yourself. in my, improve yeah. myself. Like, yeah. I work really hard and I also taught myself a lot of stuff. Um, and I and I learned from other people, like mm-hmm. working for other people, shooting for other people. But, you know, I mean, 100 yeah. percent, I I, I mean, we all get somewhere because of somebody else. Yeah, exactly. Know? And that's what he was trying to explain to me. And I was just being a stickler because I'm just like, because that's the thing is like, I, um, well, I'll, I'll just be very honest. I know what people sometimes think, you know, yeah. and it's like, I remember thinking those types of things mm-hmm. about certain people. Like, I'm like, oh, well, she's only getting that because she's with that person. Mm-hmm. But then I remember working with that person. And then I went, oh, she doesn't just get that stuff because of him. She's a fucking fantastic performer. It's a specific, 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 specific person that I'm talking about. I won't name names. Yeah. But now with me, it's like, you know, I proved myself. You mm-hmm. know, like, yes, I got those opportunities, but I had to show the fuck out. Mm-hmm. You know, I couldn't just be there and then do that and then keep getting those. Mm-hmm. You know, it was because I proved myself. Mm-hmm. And I think that's something I also always have to remind myself is that, you know, I'm a good fucking performer. And that's why these things keep happening for me. Yeah. You know, I'm doing it. So, yeah, it yeah. sounds like you very much believe in like manifesting. Yes. You know, big. I'm, I'm uh, born on one, 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 which is like an angel number of like manifestation. So, okay. yeah. So yeah. you, so do you, because one of the things that I struggle with, and I think a lot of people struggle with is when you're going through like a hard time uh-huh. and it feels like there's no opportunities for you or whatever. Do you have a faith that you can tap into that? make that tells you like things are going to manifest themselves for you because they always do and you believe in these things well and i'll tell you why literally like when i was new and i was just trying out here i mean no one was taking a chance on me like i had to message so many people beat down their doors you know like basically i wrote a cover letter sent it to people said these are my goals in the industry please take a chance on me you know i would message them and then if they didn't reply i'd message them again they say oh we'll talk to production and then i'd circle back and go did you talk to production like Mm -hmm. and then you know sandra would come to me and go oh we finally got this person it's like yeah because i talked to them Mm -hmm. you know but it wouldn't have happened if i wouldn't have talked to them Mm -hmm. and finally like then I started proving myself and I mean, it took two years. Like it felt like it was so long and I'm like, why isn't anyone noticing me? Why? And then all of a sudden it just started happening. And yeah. then all of a sudden I was shooting for Vixen all the time. And then I was like getting these roles. And then, you know, like I, be, you know, I beat down Brent for cherry of the month, you know, every month I would be like, Hey, I, I'd make one, you know, a good one this month, you know, January's my birthday. And then mm-hmm. all of a sudden I became cherry of the year and mm-hmm. you know, like it, and I remember I was in New York when I, I got asked to be Twisty's tree of the month and like that was major. I remember I started bawling because it's just like those types of things. Like it solidifies like the hard work and the stuff that I'm doing, you know, like yeah. I, I'm working so hard, Yeah, you know? So it's like really cool to like have those accolades happen um but at the same time like you're greedy you just keep wanting more i just it never ends yeah i mean that's it being ambitious right yeah it is and i think the most important thing though too is to believe that you deserve those things yeah you know i do and i know i do um yeah, I guess sometimes I have imposter syndrome where yeah, like I, I, think I we all I think we all do that. Yeah, cuz like I you know, I had uh someone tell me um that was pretty big in the industry. She said, you know, everyone around you is going to be telling you that this is your year. You're coming up. You're having this happen. You're having this happen, you know, but you're not going to feel it. And then one day you're going to look around and you'll go, "Oh shit. That's they were right." You yeah. Know? Um and so I think I'm st- I I have had those moments a few times, but um, you know, like I just got to shoot in Paris, like mm-hmm. that was major. I mean, what a, I, I mean that that's major. That's yeah. really cool, yeah, you know. And incredible. I, m- I remember sitting there being like, my vagina got me here. <laughs> like, <laughs> I was like watching the Eiffel Tower sparkle. I was like, wow, you know, like you did this. Yeah, good job. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> you know, you were you know in a hospital and you didn't think you were gonna work again. And like I remember 
sitting in my bedroom when I was still with my ex-boyfriend, you know, and following all those accounts for Vixen, all this stuff, like looking at them being like, God, will I ever shoot for that company? Will I ever do mm-hmm. that? And then here we are. Here we are. Yeah. So who knows what will happen in time? Who knows? Yeah. Well, Lily, thank you so much for coming on. It's been such a pleasure. Thank you. <laughs> um, we are going to do a quick bonus Q&A after this for my Patreon members. Some of you guys sent in some questions. So we will do that. Um, but to wrap this up, Lily, can you tell everyone where they can find you online? Yes. So my Twitter is at your fave Lil and my Instagram is at bell of the underscore ball. And my only fans is Lily underscore bell XXX. Fantastic. And you guys can find me at Holly Randall on Instagram and on Twitter. Go to hollylinks.com for all of my platforms. And of course, if you want to support this podcast and, access this bonus Q&A we're about to do, go to patreon.com slash hollyrandallunfiltered. Thank you guys so much for joining us. I'll see you next week.